I am Allison Hart. I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to our 14th annual um, Economic Summit. Today's topic is thriving in the workforce revolution, leading through unprecedented change, and that seems like a lot of words, but it's actually what we're all experiencing right now. So we're going to delve, delve into this topic, and I'm glad you're all here to join us. As we get started, I'd like to thank those who make our program possible, uh, beginning with our presenting sponsor, the Boeing Company, PGE, the City of Gresham, Frontier Communications, Mount Hood Community College, Portland, uh, Port of Portland, and there are others who have also supported us, which you'll see rolling on our screens. I'd also like to uh, thank the, our elected officials who are here today, uh, Gresham Mayor Shane Bemis. Thank you, Shane. Uh, Gresham City Councilor Lori Stegman. Gresham City Councilor Michael McCormick and Gresham City Councilor Mario uh, Palmero, as well as Fairview City Councilor Lisa uh, Barton Mullen. So thank you all for being here. The theme today actually for me came out of our summit last year. Uh, it was inspired actually by the Boeing Company's Michael Greenwood. He was talking about their overall workforce and he said that by 2015 that 50% of Boeing's um, workforce was eligible for retirement. And I was talking to, to Mike Starr just before that, and he said it's possible that locally that could be even higher. So when you think of that, that is a staggering statistic. But that's not unique to Boeing. That's happening all across the country. So we're going to delve into that um, and see what that means when it comes down to the workforce and jobs and the different um, generations in the workplace and what that means culturally for the shift uh, in our society, also in our workforce. Uh, to get started, I'm actually going to ask uh, Bess Wills to join me. She's the GM of Gresham Ford, but also the Chamber Board President. It has really been my pleasure to work with her this year. We've had a lot of fun and a lot of uh, spirited conversations. And Bess is actually going to talk to us about an important, um, they were good. That's, yeah. a, that, that's like a good thing. I think spirited conversation is good. So come on up, Bess. Okay, just so you know, Allison's the nice one, okay? So, so um, again, I want to thank all of you for being here today, and I'd like the elected officials to stand up again. We give them a big round of uh, applause for their service, please. And you'll understand what I mean, service, after I go on a little bit. <laughs> because, um, and to uh, Allison's point, I personally would like to thank Boeing for retiring Alan Mulally and saving Ford Motor Company. So <laughs> there's a lot of talent out there amongst those retired folk. <laughs> um, okay, I'm here today to talk to you about the coming job wars. And the coming war, I mean, this isn't about niceties, this is a war. The coming world war is an all-out war for good jobs. World War II was a war for all the marbles. Everything was on the line. A loss would have changed the world as we know it. The world for global jobs is like World War II, a war for all the marbles. The global war for job determines the leader of the free world. If the United States allows China or any other country or region to out enterprise it, to out job create it, to outgrow its GDP, it changes everything. This is America's war for everything. America goes broke when its GDP falls and jobs can't be found. A country goes broke one company at a time. Then one citizen at a time, it grinds down. And it's happening now, ladies and gentlemen. You and I, our friends and relatives, are going broke now because the United States of America is going broke. We all know the problem, so how do we win this war? By the book. <laughs> the 
you win this war, and I don't say you win this war, I mean you. I mean you in this room. You are the tribal leaders of our cities. You are the generals of this war. Not somebody off at the Pentagon, you are the generals. Not, not somebody far away, not Salem, not huge corporations, but you in this room. There are approximately 100 major metropolitan areas in the United States. And within those major metropolitan areas, there are 100 tribal leaders. So do the math. 10,000 people are the tribal leaders that will take us out of this great recession and to becoming world leaders again. So just in case all of you don't buy this book and all of you don't read this book, I'm going to read the one paragraph from this book that I want you all to hear. Because it's from cities that this will change. It's not from the state again. It's not from the federal government. It's from cities. How the whole city wage a war for jobs. Everybody in the charge of anything needs to focus on job creation. If they divert their attention, vote them out. Be ruthless. If the bike path doesn't have anything to do with job creation, there is no bike path. If rezoning improves the job's outlook, rezone. But not just any job will do. You want good jobs. The job war is won by knowledge jobs. Aim everything at those. The global economy is moving to the knowledge worker. You, can't, you can build a slaughterhouse in your city, but that can't be the leading job strategy. Good jobs are created by entrepreneurs, working with innovators, creating a winning business model. The jobs war is about what should get city leaders up in the morning, what they should work on all day, and what they should keep in front of them, and what they think about when they go to sleep at night. We are very fortunate that we have many, many good city leaders. But we all need to be thinking about job creation. So if cities are the core of job creating energy, everything is local. So go the local tribe leaders, so goes the soul of the city. Health and wellness is the other half of the equation. Read the book. $2.5 trillion, and we can cut that in half just by being, by preventative wellness and dealing with the end of life in a more rational manner. I guess when you signed up today, you didn't expect to be drafted into the Army. <laughs> Would you like to be in the Marines? <laughs> But by your willingness to become informed here today, you have elevated yourself to being a tribal leader. And thus, you are the generals. We thank you for your service and your participation today. So give me a big hoorah. Come on. Hoorah. One more. Come on. Hoorah. And Allison will give you some more facts about your service so you'll know your mission and create jobs and read the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bess. I actually do have a couple of extra copies of the book, so if we have not indoctrinated you already and given you one, please come and see me. Uh, there are several people in the room who already have them. So I just wanted to give you a few stats about this, um, this particular book and The Coming Jobs War, and it is uh, written by James Clifton, the chair of um, the Gallup poll and it's a global study he's actually done this over many years and it and really came down to the bottom line is what the world wants are good jobs bottom line and that they must be a factor in every policy and every law so we all need to be thinking about that in everything that we're doing some of the stats 
um, from the book, which I found to be startling and troubling. You know, the U.S. GDP it grows about 2% a year. China's is growing about 8% a year. You know, for the U.S. has to keep its growth in the neighborhood of 4.5 um, per year to maintain as a world leader, the economic leader. If this changes, it would be disastrous. Um, we would lose our role as the world leader. Um, that would mean the place of the, in the world for the best jobs would be gone for the U.S. And if it declines, our ability to support entitlements, to support government programs, military spending, schools and education, infrastructure, public safety, all of it would be threatened. So this is meant to be sobering as well the beginning of my whole presentation here um, because this is to make you all think. We hope you leave here stimulated to do something and to really think about things a little bit differently. Education is a big factor in this. 80 million potential innovators are sitting in our classrooms right now in K-12. to What are we doing to support them? Almost 30 million will drop out or fail to graduate. That's staggering. You know, 50% of minorities will drop out. We have to support these people. This dropout rate gives everyone else an advantage over us. We have to change that. As Beth said, our healthcare spending is $2.5 trillion. Most, half of that is Medicare and Medicaid. The GDP of India is $1.5 trillion. Look at that, that's, that's crazy. Healthcare is our biggest expense in the US. It costs 10 times more than the wars in the Middle East. It's rising faster than our GDP. We really have to look at this seriously to make some changes. Key message from this book is that our tribal leaders, of which all of you are in the room, need to take action and make the difference. Every, end, every policy and every end goal has to be about job creation, improving uh, education, and about health care. Whether it's lowering the cost, per, uh, preventative care, encouraging wellness programs at your workplace, you all have the power to do this. So I ask you to take this charge on and join Bess's army and our coming Jobs War army and read the book if you haven't already. So with that, this ties into our topic today because we're going to see a huge shift demographically um, in our workforce. And like I said, I was inspired by you know, Michael's comments um, last year. And so I just want to give you a few sobering statistics about what's happening um, in our workforce. And this is to frame the conversation for the whole day about how we structured um, our event. Um, and, to, and it ties into the book as well. So 40% of baby boomers are uh, currently in the workforce, or 40% of the workforce are, are baby boomers. How that breaks down is that 78 million boomers in the next 20 years are eligible for retirement. 10,000 per day is the average. That's what we're looking at. Four million per year, a lot of people. By 2015, Generation Y will outnumber the boomers in the workforce. So that's people who are 30 and under right now. That's what that means. Are we ready for that? Are our companies ready for that? Are our leaders, is your company? What are you gonna do with that loss of knowledge and, and workforce capital? I want you to take a minute to look at this table. Focus on 2015 and 2020. I wanna pull out, first of all, boomers are typically right now 49 to 67. The Gen X's are 32 to 48, and Gen Y is 18 to 31. And our speaker later, uh, Stacy, is gonna talk a little bit about the dynamic of the difference of these generations in the workplace because it's a different culture for each of these uh, people in the workplace. But look at these stats. Seven years from now, Gen Y will be 43% of the workforce. 43%, that's a huge number. It's going to be an inversion. It's gonna flip from what we are now. It's a huge loss of knowledge and expertise for our companies. You know, and my generation, Gen X, we don't have enough bodies to fill the gap of those retiring boomers. So this is our problem, our challenge or our crisis, however you wanna name it. If you look at locally, um, these stats are the Portland metro area. It runs about the same. Um, you know, the boomers are about 40% of the workforce today. You know, the Gen X runs about 20 to 23%, and the Gen Y is 20 to 24%. So this is our region. 
Today's companies right now are facing shortages of skilled labor, a dwindling talent pipeline, and a loss of critical knowledge. I went to the, the Greater Portland Inc. breakfast uh, earlier this week, and one of the key messages was around talent, and that companies need to know there's talent in the metro region to settle here. So it's something we really have to pay attention to. It's extremely important. Because of this shift, and the lack of qualified skilled workers in the manufacturing industry alone, 600,000 jobs are left unfilled. You know, we keep hearing about unemployment, and yet all of these jobs are unfilled. We've had this topic come up many times, even over the last couple of years at this summit, where some of our panelists have said, we have open positions, we just can't find someone to fill them. You know, that's very challenging, and it's a problem. Key industries that are impacted, health, Healthcare, education, manufacturing, retail and hotel, wholesale trade, professional scientific and tech services. Those are just the top of them. This graph is a little bit hard to read on here and I apologize, but what I wanted to call out is this is just for our area, the Portland metro area, and, um, and this is just for workforce 55 and above. And in, um, for those employed in healthcare, and social assistance and education. It's one quarter of our workforce here locally. That is just staggering. So what do we do about it? What's next? So I have some important questions to ask you, and I want you to think about these as we go through today's presentation. We've structured our presentations to help bring some provocative thought to you and hopefully provide some uh, answers as well. How will retirements impact your company? I know from speaking with some of my board members, PGE, Frontier, Boeing, you know, they are all facing this, not just facing it coming down the line, it's already happening. I think, you know, Ross is shaking his head. He said a third of their workforce retired last year nationwide. Is that correct, Ross? That is a staggering number of people. It's my favorite word today, staggering, because I just keep looking at these thinking, we need to do something. What kind of attrition level can you expect? Think about that. What experience and skill factors are essential for your company's future? Do you have them? Are you fostering them if you don't? Think about that. What's your talent pipeline? How will you find that talent? And then how will you keep them? You know, Xers and, and Generation Y move around a lot. So once you've got them, how are you going to keep them? Very important for the success of your organization, whether you're government, whether you're business, whether you're education, whether you're private nonprofit, whatever. This is everyone's problem. And how can you identify and develop future leaders in your company? This is the question. Because as I said, my generation, the Xers, there aren't enough of us to fill the spots being vacated by the boomers. So we need to figure something out. And now we're going to move into our presentation. And the first person that I have the pleasure um, to bring up to the stage uh, is, is Stacy Stack. And she is the vice president um, at Express Personnel. And you'll please excuse me, but I left that page of my notes on the table <laughs> as I'm looking here thinking I want to give your bio. So I'm going to leave it to you to tell I us a little bit about you. Excellent. Okay. And Absolutely. Stacey is going to talk to us about the different uh, in the workforce of Gen Y, Gen X, and the boomers. And this is really, really important because it's very different how we all look at things. So please help me in welcoming Stacy. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Oh, can I, can I have the clicker back? I'm like, Sorry. that's okay. A little repo already this morning. <laughs> and is my, is my uh, thing on? Do I have sound? Okay, just checking. All right, my name is Stacy Stack, and I'm the Vice President of Training and Development with Express Employment Professionals. So I've been with Express for 21 years. So uh, Bill Stoller recruited me off the tetherball court, said, hey, come on in. And so I just really enjoyed my passion for helping organizations and helping our employees. So I'm responsible for the training and development of 25 franchises of Express across the country, as well as travel internationally, working with our internal team members and helping them to identify how to recruit talent out of the marketplace, as well as taking a look at leadership skills and work with our client companies in not only helping them to get the right people, but do the right things with them. And so that's what I'm extremely passionate about. And I thank you for having me here today. On your table, you will see a handout. Uh, go ahead and just take a quick moment to grab one of these. And they're centrally, centrally located in the middle there. 
And so we're going to have a great conversation today about your people. Now, one of the things that I really take a look at, one of my uh, individuals that I go to is Peter Drucker. So Peter Drucker, one of the things that he has said is that the most important decisions that you make as leaders are decisions about people. You're like, that's right. I mean, because people determine the performance capacity of an organization. So the moment-to-moment -moment decisions we make are either building and developing relationships with our people or tearing them down. It's either fostering trust or creating mistrust. So I hate to tell you people is that one of the things is your people are watching you like a hawk. I know it's kind of scary, isn't it? They really take a look at you create this workplace culture based upon your leadership. And matter of fact, what I'd like you to do is everybody put your hands in the air like this. Okay, some of you are more familiar with this stance than others, but uh, what I'd like you to do is go ahead. You, now you get it. You're like, I get it now. Yes, freeze. Okay, no, that's right. Go ahead and take your hands, and what I'd like you to do is intertwine your fingers like this. All right, so how many of you have your right thumb on top? Give me a, hey, right thumb. All right, that's good. And I'm supposing the rest of you have the other side on top. Okay. Now, one of the things that we do is that in leadership, we typically go towards what's most natural and comfortable for us in a given situation. We, I call it kind of pulling the first file available. In a situation where we're interacting with people and we say, great, I'm dealing with a situation and a person, I'm going to go with what's most natural and comfortable. Now, the other thing is, go ahead and take your hands apart. And what I want you to do is put them together now and have the other thumb on top. How does that feel? It feels weird, doesn't it? Okay, now what I want you to do is go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, okay? Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that we tend to, in leadership, go and act to what's most naturally and comfortable for us, when in fact, dealing and working with other people, they mean, need me to go like this, which is not my natural tendency. So when we do take a look at generations in the workplace, we're gonna look at each one of them in a little snapshot and see kind of how they grew up kind of impacts their work and how they view things on a consistent basis in regards to work and life. So one of the questions that I have for you as we go through and as we walk through this, I want you to kind of answer some things in your own mind is, what is it like to work with you? Do your people get up in the morning and say, oh my word, I cannot wait to go to work with Ted. He's gonna teach me things, he's great, he's a great communicator, he really has a learning plan for me. Or is it when they get up in the morning, do they say, I'm going to swing by and check out Monster or Career Builder or the Express Pro's website before I go to work to see if any new jobs have been posted? And that's a fact. When we talk about the war on jobs, there is a war on talent that is incredibly fierce. We recruit 60 hours a week, let me tell you. We interview hundreds and hundreds of people all the time. The thing is, is that one of the things that they say, one of the greatest reasons why people leave an organization is who? You all. Number two, anybody want to take a guess? Bosses, okay, number one, coworkers. Guess what, because if the boss isn't there, who's there all the time? The coworkers, right? I mean, so this is a problem and this is a concern for everybody. It's not just the leadership within the organization, right? I know you're looking at each other, is that your coworker right there? You're like, uh-huh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Okay, so when we look at a generation, it's defined as roughly 20 years of a group of people who experience common life events and cultural milestones that form their values, attitudes, and life work perspectives, right? So when we look at it, and I love this, how are you going to lead a workforce that sees the world in a different way? I love this. Hey, why don't you go ahead and write me a letter? Or even two, hey, give me a call, or email me, or what's the latest one? Text me. How many of you have texted employees so far today? Raise your hand. All right, good on you. How many of you are texting each other right now in the room? <laughs> okay, where did I get this nut job? Okay, but the thing is, is that everybody is different, right? Everybody sees communication differently and how they go about doing work. One of the things that we can do to bring everybody together is focus on what do they all have in common, and that's the work itself. So drive everyone to the goals and commonalities of the organization. So we can bridge the different attitudes and expectations by constantly communicating in ways in which makes sense for those individuals. Communicate in a different variety of avenues to draw everyone in. And we want to choose our leadership and our communication style to give other people what it is that they need. Because if I don't, 
I tell you what, I'm not going to build that lasting relationship. And it's interesting, we're talking about kind of looking at the Gen Xers and Gen Yers always moving around. We're going to talk about why they move around in jobs. And you may be a little bit surprised. One of the things we've done in our organization, so I work with 25 offices with Express, I would much rather have turnover between department to department and moving people around, or entity and entity in which are, are under our umbrella of family of companies, than rather have someone leave. And we plan on it, and we watch for it. Because if we don't do it on purpose, it's going to happen that we're like, why can't we keep people? Do you ever think that? Where's everybody going? We need to keep people on purpose. And I like to think about it is re-recruiting your people every single day. The minute you walk in, you're re-recruiting. If we don't have that mentality, other people will come in and take your talent. Actually, they're not taking your talent. You're giving them the opportunity to open the door to your talent if we're not actively participating in this. So as we break this down, I know we looked at some of these statistics before, but one of the things I'd like you to do on your handout right there is just go ahead and jot down roughly what percent of your workforce is within each of these categories. Just go ahead and just take a quick moment here, because as we go through these four different generations, you can really take a look at what am I doing to retain people in each of these categories based upon kind of their natural preferences and tendencies in regards to work. All right, go ahead and just take a quick minute to do that. And I'll go ahead and pull up just some very, very important information that we're going to look at next. Talk about statistics. All right, so let's take a look at the difference between the boomers and generation Xers. Baby boomers, how many of you rode the back of a pickup truck? Raise your hand, let's give it a shout out. Woo, remember that? That was so much fun. All right, Gen Xers and Gen Ys, children remain in car seats until they're 21, okay? You can start to see the problem right off the bat, okay? Drank out of a garden hose. Who drank out of a garden Oh, was that the day you'd be playing? You're like, give me that hose. Now we've got like 45,000 types of flavored water, OK? Whoever thought they'd actually sell water that came out of a hose? I'm just saying. Whoever did that, it's amazing. Hand-me-down baby cribs with 12 coats of leaded paint, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. So, And the thing is, too, is it's space age cribs with 60 moving parts and with a monitor complete with that. Uh, we have here, too, long trips. I uh, put kids in the back dash of the car. Remember that when you could ride up? That was so cool. Now it's like, forget it. Everybody has their own DVD player and chair, OK? We have here, teachers had paddles with holes in them. Remember that? You're like, yeah, bring it. Now people will get sued if they even look at your child uh, sideways. Uh, the thing is, too, one TV, three channels with rabbit ears, and kids with a remote get up and turn that channel. Now, I tell you what, it's pretty bad. TV in every room, 300 channels, you can't even decide. Now, the thing is, too, uh, summer jobs began at age 10. Now allowance till the third marriage. I mean, pretty much. Uh, we've got only champions got awards and trophies. Remember that when there was a first, second, and what place? Third. Now we've got everybody gets a trophy because we don't want to do what? I know it's horrible, isn't it? So I want to talk about what that has done to us as employers and managers and leaders. Always had 10 cents to call home when you needed help, right? Remember, now make sure you take a dime with you or a quarter. Now, heck, everybody has their iPhone. I tell you what, baby boomers, final product. All right, you guys turned out OK, right? Now, let's take a look at what happened. <laughs> I'm serious. What happened? I mean, in all seriousness. All right, I'd like to introduce you to my mom. Uh, my friends call her Little Mom. Little Mom's 87. And so the funny thing is, is that I have recently taught my mom how to text, OK? So this is Little Mom. Hi, I'm interviewing. I'll call you when I'm done. OK, hey, you're texting. Yay, good job. I love you. I love you. What do, what do moms care about? Yeah, what's for dinner, honey? She wants to make sure I'm fit. But check this out, 87 years old and texting. I mean, she's trying to get with it, which is pretty cool. So because we've got some nephews that are really in, into sending pictures of their kids over, which is great. But be flexible. Communicate differently based upon what people want. So let's take a look here. Now, my mother told me never to ask people's ages, but guess what I'm going to do today? Everybody who's within this category, please just stand up. We just want a visual picture, even if you just kind of stand up and sit down really quick. All right, do we have anybody in this cat? All right, round of applause over here. Okay. 
Now, when we look at this, 7%, and I know that this number is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, but some statistics and some interesting, interesting information, 50% are veterans, 50%. So if you really take a look at the way that they grew up, a little bit different than a lot of us. Fiercely loyal and dedicated truth, justice, and the what kind of way, everybody say it. That's right, the American way. Courageous, value, security, and stability. Militaristic, command and control, top-down leadership, trust and authority. And duty and honor the chain of command. So it's kind of interesting when we have individuals of this group the thing is too is that just think when we have millennials come in and they're like hey i'm gonna challenge my boss this person's like what do you mean don't say anything we need to do what they tell us right anybody ever read the book message to garcia okay if you haven't i suggest you get it all right that's all i'm gonna say and for those of you that have read it you'll know the instruction that i just gave is one of the most important instructions that a traditionalist could give someone it's do what is told. Do what is told. So sacrifice, self, pay your dues. Hold your people accountable. They're watching you. Because the thing that's interesting, as a leader, how is it, is it easy to not hold people accountable for certain things, right? Because you guys are busy. But I tell you what, think about how it impacts the relationship, especially with this group of people. The thing is, you do what you say you're going to do, and you do it, and you follow through. We have here too, men were bread, breadwinners and women stayed at home. And when you came home from work, what did you have on the table? Dinner. And you got to watch cartoons, right? And you had milk and cookies. Man, those were good days, right? <laughs> what happened? The mixing of younger and older workers back then, really when they were in the workforce, wasn't really, really seen. But really taking a look at value respect and being frugal. So when we talk about change initiatives, et cetera, I mean, it's really taking a look at how is it going to impact the organization. So some tips to improve relationships offer flexible retirement options. Respect their years of experience. I think the thing is, too, is that develop programs for them to pass along their knowledge for other generations. How many of us right now have a written program for individuals that have been with our organizations for long periods of time to pass along and mentor younger people? Does anybody have that? Okay. Yeah, so just a handful of us. But if you don't, guess what happens? We have individuals who are in these age groups. They're going to retire, and when they retire, they will be gone. And what else is gone? Their knowledge. It's capturing of knowledge. It's almost like this person is a person that tells those tribal stories. But also, too, really is where does the organization come from? Its roots. Very important. Very important. So face-to-face -face communication, watch the emails, right? Watch the texting. If you probably text one of these individuals, if they're not like my mom and watching her text all day long, the thing is too is that they may really not feel like they're included in the communication pattern. Take time discussing technology. Respect their attention to formality. Don't use slang or vul vulgar language. We have one of the uh, traditionalists in our office who is actually a receptionist. And it's interesting. I bring people out, and she does a little talk as to how she likes to be interacted with. And one of the things that she says that just shocks everybody is she says, you all say you guys all the time. You know, it's like, hey, you guys, how's it going? Hey, you guys, how often do we do that? She sees it as extremely offensive. And matter of fact, once she hears that, the communication that she hears from that individual is absolutely changed. So also to think of kind of the casual dress these days, right? Not so much in a working environment. Very, very important. And also to be on time. So I know sometimes too we may have other generations that are like, hey, as long as I'm there within 10, 15 minutes, you guys are going to start without me. It's all okay. It's not acceptable. Not acceptable whatsoever. So phrases such as your experience is respected here. It's valued to the rest. The rest of us want to hear what has and hasn't worked in the past, but also to your per perseverance and val is valued and will be rewarded. Because the thing is, too, is that these individuals are gems within our organizations. So what can we do to treat them with respect? Because so many times, too, people say, well, that was so long ago. Things aren't the same anymore. But you know what? History will repeat itself if we don't identify what is changing. So what can we do to respect these individuals? 
Next up, we have the baby boomers in the house. Go ahead and stand up, baby boomers. Where are you? All right. That's right. Okay. You're like, yeah, rock on. Okay. Woo! Baby boomers. So think of that too, is that these individuals grew up underneath that mir mir uh, militaristic command and control. Do what I say I do. Be home by 10 o'clock, right? So no wonder they became a little bit rebellious, okay? So this is the me generation. The thing is to the social reformers. What war did we have when these individuals, when you all were growing up? Vietnam War, right? So you're like, why are we doing these things? They demand political correctness of work. The interesting thing is, is that they like to focus on the consensus style leadership. So no more of that, do what I say. Because guess what? That's the way their parents were and they won't stand for it. The thing is too, believe young workers should pay their dues because sometimes we have the Gen Yers and millennials coming in and saying, great, when can I have whose job? I want your job. And we'll talk about where that comes from. I have someone to blame. I do. But the interesting thing is, is that if you're one of those individuals, let's not get on it. Well, I've been here for 20 years. You're going to have to work your way up. Because guess what? A younger person is going to hear that. And what are they going to say? I am so out of here, right? <laughs> These people are stuck in the dark ages. <laughs> Mercy sakes alive. So when I come in and I say, well, I tell you what, you'll get a sabbatical too when you hit 20 years here at Express. 20 years? I'm only 22. So the thing is, too, is that really taking a look at working together. This is the first group of people that were measured and evaluated grade-wise on how well they work together. Remember that? It's like working together. Ooh, what grade did I get? A, a a B, a C? Evaluation started creeping in. This is the first group of workaholics. I tell you what, versus taking a look at the traditionalists who did what they did to work hard, really the boomers did what they did so they could get ahead. Women started getting into the workforce. Guess what started creeping up? The divorce rate started creeping up, right? It did. Because women, it's like, we, you know, really women's rights come in, which is great. Don't mind. No, I don't want the comment at break. Now you better watch out. The thing is, too, is that let's take a look at how that impacted the way we look at things. Traditionalists really saw that as that, but really too is that boomers see it as a way to reach the success. Matter of fact, these individuals are vacation hoarders. They don't go on vacation because the thing is, is that they think people cannot. That's right. But the interesting thing is, is that with, we have the millennials and the Gen Yers, they look at that vacation hoarding and they think, you know what? I don't want to be like you. So be careful the messages that you send. So if you're there till 10 o'clock at night, we don't want to come back and say, well, I was here till 10 o'clock at night last night working on this project because that's what we just need to do. The millennials look at you and say, man, you need to get a, and you know what? They're right. They're right. I think we've been really crazy about that. Like if you look at the millennials, I mean the Gen Xers, they are the author of the famous four day work week. They've got it right. And I tell you what, ask for their advice. Don't call them older workers, you younger folks. I know that always gets a chuckle, but I tell you what, how many times have I interviewed someone when they're saying, well, you know, I was working with this group of older people, and all of a sudden I'm like, older people? Okay, of course, I'm in HR, I go, whoop! But also, too, I'm like, older people? Yeah, these people in their 40s and 50s, they're just... <laughs> They're not with it. They don't have an SEO plan. They don't have a fa And I'm like, wow, I'm one of them now, aren't I? <laughs> wow. But the thing is, too, is that provide new retirement options, flex flexible work schedules, but also to work on a contract basis to help retain that knowledge because you will get to the point where you want to retire. My sister just went to a three-day work week after hoarding her vacation and having all these challenges and issues. But I tell you what, now she is so happy she can hardly stand herself. Like, give yourself a break. And the interesting thing is, is that how many of us have a written succession plan of how to really take a look at these individuals are going to be moving out of the organization? We need a bench prepared. Anyone have a written succession plan? Okay, so a couple of us do. So if you don't, guess what? These individuals will leave, and we will be left with 
the individuals and the talents that we do have. So how are we strengthening these people right now? But the thing is, is that really looking at, I mean, I've, I've worked with so many different organizations and entities. I mean, taking a look at chamber groups, rotary clubs, et cetera, typically what I find is that the membership typically lies within those two categories. So what are you doing to, like when you're a chamber, look at bringing in younger people? I call this the great computer divide, because guess what? Did those two people grow up with computers? No, absolutely not. So let's look at the Gen Xers. The Gen Xers are born between 1965 and 1978. Let's have you go ahead and stand proud, Gen Xers. Let's, that's right. Woo! Yeah. OK, wow, good group. I know you're like, yay, Gen Xers. All right. OK, now let me explain something here. Yeah, you're like, yeah, we're so cool. I mean, it's, it's all good. Now, interestingly enough, now remember the divorce rate went up, right? So no longer are the cookies and milk when you get home. This was the first generation of latchkey kids. So when you got home, who was there to take care of you? Yeah, the dog, right? You get a, the TV. That's right. When you really look at it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, we kind of joke around about the TV, but looking at the difference in generations. So, I mean, even looking at, you guys fill in the blank. A penny saved is a penny. Money doesn't grow on, right? Keep your nose to the, all right, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. God. I mean, so really looking at the frugality, moving over to getting ahead and work. Now we're moving into, you know what? I do not want to end up like you. So what happened was, is that mom would, right before she went off to work, she'd say, OK, dinner's in the refrigerator. And if somebody knocks on the door, don't do what? Because I don't want you talking to any. All of a sudden, stranger danger started. <laughs> and paranoia. We were the first group of kids that they actually had to examine our Halloween candy for what? <laughs> ah! Where did those come from? Now, people wonder why. How many of you think the Gen Xers are kind of like, I'm just going to take care of myself? I mean, no wonder. Because guess what? They were left alone to self-supervise. So when they get into the workplace, no wonder they don't trust us because of the very fact they had to pretty much take care of themselves growing up. So uh, tap into that independence. Because if you don't, then they don't like to be micromanaged, right? So we have here too, don't believe that any institution or person will see them through because they saw their parents work themselves to death. And guess what they said? I don't want to be like you. Matter of fact, they started having kids and we'll talk about how that transferred over to Gen Y and why they are the way they are. But even too, looking at tech savvy, they value work-life balance, straightforward, no nonsense, get it done and move on attitude. The thing is to lead by competence, because I tell you what, they're watching you like a hawk. If we're not constantly feeding them new information and giving them more autonomy and authority, they will move and they will move on to someone else who will. We need to do it on purpose and identify this talent, because guess what? These are the individuals who are going to move up in our organization and become the future leaders. So if you just think too, wow, they're very independent. Take advantage of it. Matter of fact, I had a phone call with some of the people on our leadership in our organization this last week about how we can take a look at helping people to even work from home. What can we do in our business to give people more freedom to have more work-life balance? Because guess what? I mean, we do a lot of surveys, et cetera, and that's one of the things. What can we do better in that area? So one of the things I will tell you just in regards to work-life balance that I will mention is that when an individual is given a task to be done, and let's say they finish it in eight hours, they expect to be able to go home because they're finished with the expectations. So if we're a boomer manager and we come out, but there's so much to do in this area, and you say, look, I've gotten my goals met that you've given me. What else do you want me to do? The thing is, too, is that they see having somebody work a lock of overtime is an active incompetency upon the management team because they cannot teach them how to do things better, faster, stronger, streamline processes, or even two, there's too much work for one person to be done, you need to hire someone else. But we boomers, we say, no, just work more what? Hours. You don't need a family. 
Come on! I've been out of vacation in two years! <laughs> no wonder they don't want to be like you. I even had somebody in a workshop say, say I want to go home at 4 o'clock because I don't want to be like you. You work way too much. And then this, this gal was like, what's your relationship like with your family? And I'm like, <gasps> um, i got to go home. <laughs> But really take a look at what delegating tasks describe the outcomes, but leave the process to them, mentor them, talk with them. But the other thing is, is that looking at rewarding them with time off and how can we work more efficiently in that area. But even too, when you're looking at working with them, talk about fun, freedom, and flexibility. How often do we talk about having fun at work? But I tell you what, those who do create that environment for retention. Because people like to enjoy work. They like to build those relationships. If you want to know how to do something technical, just ask them. But also, too, value their need for keeping learning. Because if you do not have an individual learning plan for each one of these people, actually this group and the next group, they will leave you because they will find someone who is heavily embedded in training, and they will go to work for them. I mean, I oversaw about 500 hours worth of training this last year. We offered about 190 or so different workshops to our employees and clients. Because we know, even if somebody doesn't want to partake in something right then and there, the thing is, too, that education is available to them. So what kind of education do you offer? Have a career path model that supports the retention. Keep them moving from position to position and allow them to multitask. Because so many times we bring people in, it's like, yeah, I've been doing the same job for 20 years. These people see that, and what do they say? Ah! <laughs> I don't want to be like who? You. And don't take that personally, but take it personally. You know what I mean? <laughs> OK. So here are my millennials. I'll stop with the last one. Now, this is Ariel and Scarlett. Ariel lives here, and uh, Scarlett lives in New York City. The only way that I can know that these two are alive is I check their Twitter. Let's just say, lay it out. I mean, I'll text them, you know, not so much. So I don't get really anything back. But I check Twitter. I can see, oh, my Aunt Stacy just sent me this great picture. I have to go and see what's going on with me when I look at their Twitter, too. But the interesting thing is, is that the baby boomers raised these, or the baby boomers raised the Gen Xers. The Gen Xers had the millennials. So the millennials said, I was a latchkey kid. I don't want to raise my kids like my parents did, right? So what happened was is that this is the most over-supervised generation <laughs> in the history of work. Because right now we have four different generations working together, really. So you can see how these all play in together. Interestingly enough is that when I say over-supervised, how many different classes do they go to a week? Like soccer, ballet, what else do we have? Taekwondo. Chinese class, I mean, cooking class, art class, ice skating, you know, they're busy, aren't they? And the thing is, too, is that they're busy. They want to be involved in their lives. So the thing is, too, is that we joked around about, remember, there was always in contests and races, there was always a first, second, and a third. Well, guess what? Now, everybody gets a trophy. These are probably the most loved kids ever because their parents are so involved with them. Guess what? They leave home, they come to work, and who do they work for? You, right? <laughs> so you're like, oh my word, these people are so needy. <laughs> but guess what? They are loved. They are talked to. They are taught things. They have more education than probably all the other groups combined. They're always learning. Let's have our millennials go ahead and stand up. Round of applause for you all. That's right. <laughs> Woo! My word. So when we look at it, the thing is, too, is that really taking a look at giving people feedback. So if you're the kind of manager that just says, OK, great, here's your task. I'm out of here. And then I leave that person alone for a long period of time, they're going to wonder what happened to you. Because they're going to think, well, my mom and dad always tell me I do a good job. How come nobody here is telling me I'm doing a good job? <laughs> right? So that feedback is important. So if we don't have regular and consistent, again, learning plans for these individuals and really ways in which we can recognize and appreciate them, the thing is, too, is that we will lose them as well as career path models. I mean, on our organization, we take a look at, you know, Shastina, how many positions have you had within our company? Six, and how many offices have you worked in? OK, and how long have you been with us? OK, what, how old were you when you started? 
22. I mean, so that's, that's a lot of work. I mean, but doing it on purpose and recognizing people who bring a lot to the table and look at career pathing and succession planning and what can we do. So Dana, you've worked in a couple of different offices as well. And so we want to keep Dana engaged because otherwise Dana will go leave. And do we want Dana to leave? No, you can't have Dana. <laughs> All right. So hopeful, high self-esteem, close to parents and grandparents, collaborative, determined, polite. And a lot of times, too, in college, these individuals are graded based upon how they work together with teams. So if we don't put them working together with teams and we isolate them by themselves, they're going to feel lonely. Matter of fact, making friends at work is a very important thing for these individuals. They'd like to have friends there. So if we're not creating opportunities for them to do things like volunteer work together, outings together, et cetera, the thing is, is that we're gonna miss out on that opportunity. We do work with like Habitat for Humanity in some of our divisions where we get everybody together. Whoever would like to go can go. So it's all about what it is that they need from them. These people really look at over 40 hours a week on the internet. So if you're not incorporating the internet into your jobs and communication via texting, et cetera, or have a Facebook page or even a blog where it sends automatic updates for communication on projects, we're really missing out on the opportunity. 40 hours. All right. Multitasking using several medias simultaneously. Paperless. How many of our companies have a ton of paper? All right. We just moved a gal into my department to really take a look at what can we do to eliminate paper and to streamline efficiencies. Some of us that have been around for a long time with a lot of paperwork, how do you think we feel? Freaked out. But you know what, if we don't do this, we're gonna be left behind. Constantly looking for new ways to do things. Great at teamwork. No old fashioned long-term pay your dues loyalty. So if you have a recognition program where in three years you will get this, in five years you will get this, I tell you what, they're not looking out that far. They're saying, three years? What's, what are you going to do for me today? What are you going to teach me today? Because the thing is, too, is that when they come in and say, I want your job, remember their parents told them, you can be anything you Right. So you wonder where that comes from. Now you know. So when somebody comes in, you know what you say? Right, you can be anything you want to be. And I have people that interview with me and they say, I want your job. And I say, you know what? Let's create a plan so you can work for that. Okay? Oh, here she comes. All right. <laughs> There's a couple other things. So if you don't have an SEO plan, what does SEO stand for? Okay, for the rest of you that didn't know what that is, you can Google it later. All right, search engine optimization. But the thing is, too, is that really taking a look at having that mentoring plan. So my goal to you today is to ask that question down there at the bottom of the paper. What will you do to work differently with each generation? How are you bringing this to the table? How many of us are doing generational training with our teams to talk about the different generations and how we can work together? If you're not, there's an opportunity in itself. So thanks for sharing time with me today. I absolutely appreciate it. So. Oh, OK. I was like, hey. All right. OK, so she was saying, too, we just have a couple of minutes for questions. Questions? I don't know, like, oh, mercy, I've got to get home and appreciate my. You can go ahead and text your millennial right now. How's that? <laughs> Absolutely. So thanks for having me. Okay.